You might hear me uh, sniffling a little bit this morning. I promise you it's, it's not cold. I would uh, never do that to any of you. It's just uh, winter allergies from the cold. I've been taking some new allergy medication at night, so it seems to be working a little bit. I can actually breathe out of my nostrils. Uh, it's uh, Zizol. Zizol, that's the name of the brand. Yeah, it's a, I think it's a derivative of Zyrtec. Yeah. Prior to uh, 2020 BC, well, nobody uses BC anymore. People use BCE now, right? Uh, by BC, I mean before COVID. <laughs> I used to follow a Bible reading program. And maybe you follow the Bible reading program uh, in the past, or maybe you're following one uh, right now. And in the Bible reading program that I was following, I would read four passages of the Bible every day. Uh, that included an Old Testament passage, a proverb, a psalm, and a New Testament passage. And this is a very common kind of Bible reading program. How many of you have tried this kind of Bible reading program? Yeah, so a lot of you. So, and for those of you who have done this kind of Bible reading program, how long would it take you to do all of the readings in one day? <laughs> so, for me, it would take me about, you know, an hour, maybe 40, 50 minutes to an hour each day to do all of those reading, because it wasn't just a chapter. It was like sometimes two chapters at a time. And according to this Bible reading program, like Brett said, if you read all of these passages for an hour a day, every single day for 365 years, I mean, 365 days, <laughs> You would read the Bible in one year. Now, I have never read the Bible in one year. Never happened. I've always missed some days here and there. So maybe at most, I've read the Bible in a year and three months. And that, of course, sets you back for the next year. <laughs> so it's an ever-recurring cycle of not ever being able to read the Bible in a year. And today, uh, I've read the Bible just only uh, three times in my life. Not a great number. I've lived for almost 30 years. <clears throat> Yet, if I were honest with you, if I was honest with myself, I would have to admit that I barely know the Bible. And that's what concerns me, because I'm teaching today. <laughs> Why Mike asked me to teach, I have no idea. So you can blame, you can blame Mike and the adult council. What do I mean when I say I barely know the Bible? What I mean is that I, I kind of know it like a summer reading book. You know the, what I'm talking about? That book that you have to read over the summer before the start of the new school year. And it's never just one book. Right? It's more like two or three books a year. Right? The Grapes of Wrath. As I Lay Dying, Pride and Prejudice, uh, Fahrenheit 451, Moby Dick. Can anyone name any other titles you have to read over the summer? Huckleberry. Oh, Huckleberry Finn, yeah. yeah. Any other ones? 1984. 1984. So all of us have done this kind of summer reading. Now, by the time high school came, I became a better student, a decent student. And even I found it difficult to do all of that summer reading. If you really wanted to actually read all the books, um, you would have to read every single day of the summer and for hours at a time, and you couldn't miss a day. So even though there were more important things to do like baseball or fishing or getting ice cream or going to the movie theaters, um, there just wasn't enough time in the summer to read all of those books and really understand them. So even though I did the reading, because I didn't understand the reading, I still had to buy another set of books. What books do you think I bought? 
Cliff notes. Cliff notes, those yellow little packets and booklets. I might as well just not even read the books at all. There just wasn't enough time over the summer to really read those books and really understand them. Is it possible that one year is not enough time? Too short to read the Bible and really understand it? To tell you the truth, when I was doing that Bible reading plan, a very common Bible reading plan, each day that I read the Bible, I couldn't even remember what I read yesterday. What did I read on Monday? And when the next week came around, what I read the last week, out of sight, out of mind. So when the uh, COVID-19 lockdowns happened, you remember the, the two weeks to slow the spread, the government officials came up and showed you some graphs and bell curves, it turned into two years. Because I didn't have to commute in traffic anymore, everybody but essential workers were at home. So that cleared up room on the freeway. I had some extra time in my day, a little bit, about an hour. So I came up with my own Bible reading plan. So those of you who know me know I am extremely vain. So what do you think I named it? Bible reading plan. I named it after myself. I call it the Stephen Bible Reading Plan. Let me, let me tell you how it went, okay? Rather than read four different passages a day, I would read just one passage a day. The same passage every day for seven days every week before moving on to the next passage. And where do you think I start? Yeah, at the beginning. The book of Genesis. Genesis chapter one on Sunday, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. On Monday, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. On Tuesday, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And in the very first week that I started doing this, I kid you not what a change it brought. Each day that I read that same passage again and again, I would notice details that I didn't catch the previous day. I would begin to understand things that I didn't understand on Sunday. I would learn things about God that I didn't learn about him on Monday. I would become convicted of things that I wasn't convicted of on Tuesday, and the passage would follow me in my life. It would appear in my mind throughout the week. It would insert itself, apply itself into my daily life. For the very first time in my life, telling you the truth, I felt like I was actually meditating on God's word. I'm almost 30. How did I discover this just two years ago? Meditating on God's word, as the psalmist says, day and night. So today, I am offering my Bible reading plan to you, <laughs> an exclusive one-time only offer for just five easy, no, I'm just kidding. I've been watching um, Ron Popeil commercials. You remember the Ronco, yes. the Ronco rotisserie guy? Great salesman. Why am I talking about I'm not bringing up my Bible reading plan because that's what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm only bringing it up because it made a big impact in my life. That's all. So if you found your daily Bible reading plan wanting, I really encourage you to try out my Bible reading plan. Just try it out for a week. If you don't like it, send it right back. No questions asked. Okay? <laughs> but if it turns out that it does make a change in your life. Let me know. I'd like to know. So that's what I've been doing in 2020. I've been reading the, the book of Genesis. And along the way, I've learned some lessons. Lessons about faith. Lessons that I 
I really needed in 2020. 2020 was a difficult year for many Americans. Some Americans lost family members and friends to a disease that we never saw coming. Others lost their jobs and any sense of financial stability for maybe the rest of their lives. Some were considering career changes. Maybe 2020 was a difficult year for you too. It was definitely a difficult year for me. Some of it was pandemic related, some of it was not. And the lessons I learned about faith in my readings in the book of Genesis really carried me through 2020. And since the name of our church is Faith OPC, when Mike asked me to put a teaching series together, I thought to myself, well, how fitting. I believe the name of our church, the emphasis is on faith, right? It's not on OPC. <laughs> so I thought I'd share what I learned with you. Over the last few months, I've taken what I've learned about faith from the book of Genesis, and I've put together a teaching series with you in mind. So if you are experiencing a crisis of faith, if you're not sure whether the routine of Christianity is doing it for you anymore, if you feel like oh, it's all been a waste of time and effort, this series is for you. Or maybe you're new to the faith. You've just recently come to believe in the core fundamentals, the essentials, and you're wondering where do I go from here? This series is also for you. Or maybe you've been faithful for many years now. You've been growing in your faith, but now you have children and you're struggling. You're struggling to pass that faith on to them. This series is for you too. The title of my series is The Faith of God's Family, Lessons in Faithfulness from the Book of Genesis. You know, it's very interesting. We know that the word Genesis means beginning. And there is a uh, car make from Hyundai I mean, a new line of cars called Genesis, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't know what they're trying to say. Maybe they're trying to say that they're marking a new beginning in automotive engineering and design, right? A Korean beginning <laughs> in automotive engineering. No longer the day of the German vehicle and the Japanese cars, right? But if I were to ask you what beginning the book of Genesis is about, I think most of us will say, the beginning of the world, how God created the heavens and the earth. And because of this, what ends up happening is we think that the book of Genesis is about only one beginning. But I want to propose to you this morning that the book of Genesis is not a book about the beginning. It is a book about beginnings, plural. One of those beginnings is the beginning of the family of God. In the book of Genesis, in the upcoming weeks, we will see that God is building a family. And that family includes both God himself and men. But not every man. Not everyone is a member of the household, the family of God. Everyone who is a member of God's family is not a member by conventional means, not by birth, but by heavenly means, by faith. Now, in the first generation of that family, that faith starts off small, very small, so small that it's almost unrecognizable, maybe even obscure or even elusive to us. But with each passing generation, as God adds new family members into his household, the faith of God's family grows. The new generation learns from the old. 
the faith that starts off small and weak grows large and strong. For thousands of years, God has been adding new members into his family. And that faith has been growing into the faith of God's household today. You know, some of us come from Christian families. Those of us who come from Christian families, uh, whether we uh, appreciate it or not, we have a great privilege. And I don't like to use that word because that word now has different connotations related to skin color. We have a great privilege. We have a privilege and blessing of learning from our parents, our grandparents, our great-grandparents, lessons in faithfulness. I come from a Christian family and I can say with definitive truth, I've been blessed by the men and women of faith in my family. My great uncle recently published his life memoir. The title of his book is Life is Worth Living even in the fields of Cambodia. Maybe you recognize that I look Asian, it's obvious. But maybe you don't know that I'm Cambodian. While he was writing his memoir, he sent me drafts of it, his manuscript, and I was really interested in reading them because I didn't know much about his early life. I know the man that he is now, but I didn't know the man he was then. I didn't know how much pain, how much suffering my great uncle experienced under the communist rule of the Khmer Rouge. Oddly enough, a communism that our country seems to want so badly. He watched as his own parents were suffocated to death with plastic bags. He was starved to the point where he had to sneak out at night from the concentration camp at risk of death to bite onto the neck of a cow to quench his hunger. I didn't know how difficult it was for him to immigrate here and start life all over again. He went from a family of owning servants and land to becoming a janitor at an elementary school. And in the very first week that he was walking home at night, living here in America, he was jumped by a gang of thugs. He was so embarrassed that he circled the block for hours because he didn't want to come home for his wife to see him that way. But in the midst of his suffering, Wow, every line, every page was saturated. It was overflowing, dripping with faithfulness. Never once did he doubt God's provision and care in his life. He lived as if he could see something others could not see. He lived as if he had a lamp unto his feet, a light unto his path. His memoir is filled with thankfulness, gratitude, and worship. His faithfulness is a witness, a testimony to God's own faithfulness to my family, generation after generation. And here I am, upset that I don't have a Porsche in the driveway. I wish I could have that same kind of faithfulness. How about you? We can learn a thing or two from our family about faith. 
And in this series, we will do just that. We will learn lessons in faithfulness from our spiritual family, the family of God. And we're going to go all the way back to the beginning. Each week that we get together, we're going to look at the faithfulness of each generation in the family of God in the book of Genesis. But we'll do that next week. Today, I merely want us to get situated with two of the themes I've mentioned so far, family and faith. So in the time that we have left together, I want us to take a look, a closer look at these two themes. And doing so will set the context. It'll prepare us for next week when we look at the faith of God's family from generation to generation. First, the theme of family. God has a family. God has a family. Now in the grand scheme of human religion, it's not unusual for God to have a family. Many religions uh, preach that God has a family in the mountains or clouds up somewhere, or there is a divine family filled with gods. As Western people were familiar with Greek literature, the Greeks had the Parthenon. They had Zeus and his family. In Eastern religion, the Hindus have the family of Brahmin, uh, the Hindu god. Why is that the case? Why is it that a shared feature of pagan religions is that there exists up in the clouds somewhere a family of gods? Well, it's due to a theological principle that I call theological projection. What is theological projection? Let's take a look at this one word at a time. Let's take a look at the word projection. To project means to throw in front of. So projection is to throw. Pro meaning before or in front. Theological projection then is to throw in front of God. And what we throw in front of God, because it lands in front of God, becomes our image of God. It becomes what we see when we look at God. A number of years ago, well, maybe not that long ago, but it feels like it's been a long time. Rod Post taught a teaching series based on R.C. Sproul's book. That book was titled, Everyone's a Theologian. This is a very interesting title, it's intriguing. Because how could R.C. Sproul, a theologian himself, say that everyone's a theologian when we know that theologians have to go to school? Preferably Westminster, right? Although he didn't use the words theological projection in his book, He can say that everyone's a theologian because of the principle of theological projection. Everyone's a theologian because everyone has a set of beliefs that form their understanding of God. Whether God is or God is not, that they throw on to God, that they throw in front of God. And so what is it that we throw? Well, we throw whatever it is we like whatever it is we think God is like, or what we want God to be like, God in our image. And so more often than not, we throw onto God, what we throw onto God is usually the result of our own personal experience. Because this is the natural way that we learn things. We learn things by experience. Scientism is a form of experientialism. So all of us have engaged in theological projection at one point in time in our lives. Let me give you a few examples. You grow up 
with an abusive father. You come to church, you're told God is father. You conclude that if this is the way fathers is like, God is just like the father you have. Theological projection. You attend a church, you have a horrible experience, maybe legalism or hypocrisy. You think to yourself that this is the way God's people are like, God must be that way too. Theological projection. Or you grow up never having felt any form of acceptance in your life. It's left a deep hole inside of you. You want it to be filled so badly so you conclude God has to be all accepting because that's what I really need. Theological projection. Why is it that a shared feature of pagan religions is that there exists somewhere a family of gods? It's simple. It's because we have families. Conclusion, therefore God must have a family. Theological projection. Now, most of the time, theological projection results in disasters <laughs> about our understanding of God. But in this case, the pagans are right. God does have a family. But there's a big difference between the reason why they believe God has a family and why we believe God has a family. They believe by theological projection. We do not believe by theological projection. God doesn't have a family because we have families. Rather, it's the opposite. We have families because God is family. How is God family? By his triune nature, he is family. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's not a coincidence that two of the three members of the Godhead refer to themselves as Father and Son. Take a look at what God the Father said in Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, speaking of his son while he was being baptized. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. God the Son, Jesus, speaking of God the Father in Luke chapter 23, verse 46, Father, his dying breath, I commit my spirit. You see, the fact that God, the Father, and God the Son relate to each other in the context of family indicates to us that God is family. He is the essence of family. He is the real family from eternity past to eternity present. He is the ultimate vision and picture of what our family should be like. We have families because God in his triune nature is family. Now the pagans may be right that God is family, but they're wrong about the members of his family. In ancient uh, Greek mythology or religion or Hinduism, the members of God's family are all God. They're all divine, they're all heavenly beings. But in the Christian religion, the members of God's family is very different. The family of God includes both God and men. This, the divine members, the three persons of the Trinity, the earthly members, you and me, this doesn't make sense. How could it be possible? You know, in our natural experience, the family that we're born into, <laughs> that's the family that we're a part of. The family you're a part of is dependent on the family you're born into. And so as a man, we're born into the family of man. 
how then could it be possible that we could ever be born into the family of God? With God, this is possible. Why? Because one of the divine members of the family of God became a man. And he remains both God and man. And those who are born into him have the privilege of being born into the family of God. Do you see? This is what Jesus said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verse 5. In the dead of night, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I think we underestimate the doctrine of God as man and its vast implications. This is the way that we usually think of the relevance of the doctrine of God as man. He became a man like me so that he could become a sacrifice for me. If he did not become like me, then his works of righteousness are not meaningful. Of course, a God can, can obey his own laws and commandments. But because God became a man, it is a man that obeyed all of God's commands. But the implications of God as man is far more reaching than that. Because God became a man, I can be united to him. If he did not become a man, I cannot be united to God. Take a look with me at Romans chapter 5, verse 14. The Apostle Paul alludes to this. What does he say? He says, Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many die through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ abounded for many. Notice the emphasis. Jesus as man. We can be we as men can be born into the family of God because Jesus became a man, is right now a man, and will remain a man for eternity. God has a family. Why? Not because we want him to have a family, but because he is the essence of family. That family includes both God and man, and how is this possible? Because Jesus is a man. But we understand that not everybody is a part of the family of God. Why is that? Well, in order to answer that question, we need to talk about two types of causation. This is something that I've had to teach uh, new scientists and in the field of biology and genetics. Two types of causation, ultimate causation and proximal causation. Proximal meaning closer to the effect in question and ultimate meaning farther from the effect in question. So let's consider a scenario, okay? Let's pretend that we're British. Awful, I know. We're proud Americans, we're not part of any EU. Let's pretend we're British for just a few minutes and let's say that when you wake up, instead of grinding your coffee beans and making coffee, you wake up to make tea, okay? And in order to make tea, we need hot water. So you fill the tea kettle with water. You set the kettle on the stove. You turn on the heat and the water boils. Now, let me ask you, 
and I want to hear your answers. Why did the water boil? Give me some answers. Give me some reasons. <laughs> so John likes to use fear. Hey, yeah, because it got hot. What's another reason? What's another reason why the water boiled? You want a tea. Another reason, Jim? You turn on the gas. Any other reasons? <laughs> and because you're British. That's what you drink. That's what you drink. Now, among these, which would be the most proximal reason why the water boiled? The heat, right? And what would be the ultimate reason? What's the most ultimate you could think of? Yeah, you want a tea and you're British. Okay. Which of them were wrong? Neither. God has a family, but not every member is, not everybody is a member of God's family. And as reformed, right, we're reformed, uh, Presbyterian, OPC Presbyterian, we may be inclined to reach for the ultimate answer. Right? And that ultimate answer would be that not everyone is a member of God's family because God has not adopted them into his family. He hasn't elected them. He hasn't chosen them, predestined them to be a member of his family. That's why not everybody is a member of the family of God. However, I hope I don't get excommunicated for this. Mike, Joe, no, <laughs> not an ultimate. There's another answer. Not an ultimate one. A proximal one. And that answer is faith. Yes, that faith can only be possible by adoption and election, just like the water can only boil if you wanted to make tea in the first place, but don't miss the point. The point here is that even though it is not an ultimate answer, it is still a valid answer because it is a proximal one. Yes, not everyone is a member of the family of God because God has not adopted everyone as members of his family, but also, yes, not everyone is a member of the family of God because not everyone has faith. We see this in Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, when Paul says, For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God, through faith. We also see this when John says in John chapter 1, verse 12, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Why are only some people members of the family of God? Because in order to become a child of God, you have to have faith. Unfortunately, faith is hard to come by. It's almost as scarce as our economy right now. <laughs> but that leads me to our next theme. What is faith? What do you say most people would say faith is? You're talking with your friends at work. You ask them, hey, what do you think faith is? What do you think they would say? Anybody? A belief in something? Something you can't see? Mm -hmm. I would say that most people outside of the Christian faith would define faith as some kind of belief, some kind of confidence, uh, belief or confidence that even ignores all available evidence. We don't pride ourselves in being people of faith anymore. We pride ourselves in being people of science. And there was a time when you attended somebody's funeral and it was a good thing when somebody said about the man who died that he was a man of faith. Not today. Today, probably they would say he was a man of science. If I were to ask you for a Bible verse to help me understand what faith is, what Bible verse would you give me? I heard Hebrews. Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 
verse 1. Let's turn there. Let's look at it. I'm about to enter into very dangerous territory. If I haven't already entered it already. One of the things that I tell Abby is the most challenging things to teach on is to teach on things that are already familiar to people. And that's the challenge that I have now. When someone has it, can they read it, please? Now faith is the substance of things not seen yet. Right. Notice that that verse has two clauses, the independent clauses. He said that faith is the substance of things hoped for. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. Now, does anybody have any other translations? Does your translation say anything different? If it says something different, can you read it? Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Thank you, Steve. Notice the, notice the two words that are used in Steve's translation. It says that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Now notice the other two words that were used in the previous translation. It says that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So usually the older English translations use substance and evidence. And the newer translations use assurance and confidence or conviction. And this is probably because one of these translations is easier to understand. Right? One is easier to make sense of. Which one would you say is easier to make sense of? Assurance and conviction or substance and evidence? Yeah, I heard assurance and conviction. That's the easier one to make sense of. And it's easier because we know what those things feel like. Yeah, they are subjective terms. We know what it feels like to feel assured. We know what it feels like to feel convicted. The harder translation to make sense of is the one that says substance and evidence. Why is this harder? How can faith be the substance of things hoped for? If you're hoping for something, then it's not real yet. If it's not real yet, how can its substance exist before it becomes real? How can faith be the evidence of things not seen? If you can't see it, how could we ever find evidence for it? Well, the way that we find evidence of things is by looking. But the problem goes even beyond the problems I just mentioned with this translation. Because we read it closely, the claim here that faith is the substance of the things that we hope are going to happen. It is the substance of the things that does not exist. The claim here in this translation is that faith is the evidence of the very things we cannot see. The evidence of the thing that cannot be seen. Now, don't think that these Bible translators don't know that when you translate it as substance and evidence, that it's difficult. But there's a good reason why it's translated this way. The words that are used here are hypostasis, or hypostasis, the substance, and elecon. Elecon meaning evidence. The, the word hypostasis came during the Hellenistic period, about 300 years before the birth of Christ. And it came in a philosophical context. It was used to communicate a form of reality that is behind the reality that we see, or underneath the reality that we see. And the word elikos is a form of legal terminology used in a court of law refers to a kind of proof, a kind of evidence that is, worth, is good enough to result in a conviction, to result in a decision. But as we saw earlier, it's hard to make sense. 
of what this translation is saying. Let me propose a way of understanding this verse. Faith makes real what has not happened yet. It makes visible what is invisible. Because it makes real what has not happened yet, it is the substance of the underlying reality of what is going to happen. Because faith makes visible what is invisible, it is and it becomes the evidence of things not seen. And this is how we can have assurance. This is how we can have confidence because if it is real, right now, even though it has not happened yet, we can be assured. If it can really be seen, even though it is not visible yet, we can have confidence, we can have conviction. How is this possible? How is it real even though it is not real yet? How is it seen even though it is not visible yet? Verse three gives us the answer. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. So that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. How is it real even though it is not real yet? How is it seen even though it is not visible yet? It is by God's word. Notice what the author is saying here in verse three. Were you there when God created the heavens and the earth? Did you see it? No, I didn't see it. I wasn't there. Was Adam there when God created the heavens and the earth? No. He didn't see it. So how do we know? How do we know that God created the heavens and the earth? Where did we get such an idea? Because God said it. We know it by God's word. You see, human assurance, the feelingness of assurance, human conviction, the feeling of confidence cannot make things happen. It cannot make things visible. You see, by faith, the things that have not yet happened become real right now, even though they have not yet happened because they were made real because God said it by God's word. By faith, the things that are invisible to us, the things that we cannot see, the things that we have not seen, they are made visible by God's word. When God says it, it is real. See, this is how what has not happened yet becomes real because it is already real in the mind of God when he says it. This is how what is invisible becomes visible because it is already seen by God. When we believe what God says, we tap into that reality. <clears throat> Some of you know that I have a 16-year-old living with me now, and he, he talks a lot. He asks a lot of questions. And uh, whenever he asks me Bible questions, I always give him the same response over and over again. I tell him, because God says so. Oh, man, he hates that response. He says, you know what I mean? I'm not, I'm not asking you for that answer. I want to know why. I want to know how. You know what I tell him? I said, why do you want to know why? Why do you want to know how? Is it because you want to know why and you want to know how? Because unless you understand why and unless you understand how, you can't believe it. No, you ought to believe it and then understand why and how. This is what faith is. Faith is not a blind conviction or confidence despite the absence of reality. Faith is belief in a greater kind of reality, the reality of God's word, which is evidence of itself. In this series, we will learn 
how our great ancestors in the family of faith exercise faith by living in a reality that has not happened yet, in a reality that they did not see. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your family. By their faith and their life, they received a good con accommodation, a witness and testimony to your own faithfulness to your family. Lord, help us to rejoice that we have been born into your family. And that as children of God, we ought to live and walk by faith. It's not easy. Lord, let your lamp be a light unto our feet and our path. Let us live not by our own earthly sight, but by a heavenly sight that sees more clearly than what we see now. Grant us the power of your spirit to do that today and the rest of the week and the rest of our lives. As we pray in Jesus' name, amen.